But I think that what makes me successful as a brand consultant for consultants and coaches, particularly those who are working in organizations is the depth of the understanding and empathy of all the different business lines and the value that I have, like I can get inside their heads. You know, so I always teach people from a branding side and from a marketing side, you know, like you begin with your ideal client and figure out who they are. What's your reaction when you hear the word politics? Does it make you want to run away or is it something that you run towards? Well, get ready to fall in love with politics, corporate politics, in this episode of Chain of Learning and learn how you can effectively leverage politics to step into your leadership potential. Welcome to Chain of Learning, where the links of leadership and learning unite. This is your connection for actionable strategies and practices to empower you to build a people-centered learning culture, get results, and expand your impact so that you and your team can leave a lasting legacy. I'm your host and fellow learning enthusiast, Katie Anderson. Whether you're an internal change leader, executive, or have your own business. If you work with groups of people or with organization, you work with politics. Politics is simply the set of activities that are associated with making decisions in groups or other forms of power dynamics among individuals and within organizations. Being able to navigate and leverage politics is an essential skill for your success and impact. In episode nine of this podcast, I introduced my change catalyst model, catalyst spelled with a K, K K-A-T-A-L-Y-S-T, and the eight essential influence, coaching, and relational competencies that you need to become a transformational change leader, regardless of your official title or function. I've received a lot of positive feedback about how this model is helping change leaders like you really more deeply understand their role and potential impact. One leader even wrote to me to say that they had never thought about the competencies in this framework, but they can really see how having these eight competencies are really gonna help them describe what they do and the impact that they want. I was surprised though, that I got consistent feedback that there was one competency that a lot of people hadn't been thinking about as critical to their impact and success. And that was being an astute political navigator. Today, I want to do a deep dive into this competency and help you understand how you can move from the theories around what this is all about into tangible practices that will help up-level your influence game and really step into being this transformational change leader. And to help me with this, I have invited one of the master political navigators and consultants that I know to Chain of Learning. Betsy Jordan is an accomplished entrepreneur, business mentor, and keynote speaker, and she is a master, astute political navigator. Betsy is a seasoned organizational development consultant with nearly 30 years of experience advising executives in leading change in world-class companies like Disney, Wyndham, and AAA. And Betsy has transitioned her OD expertise into supporting external coaches and consultants as a business mentor and brand messaging strategist. Betsy is part of my own personal and professional chain of learning as I have been partnering with her for nearly two years for my own continued growth and evolution for my business and my impact. Betsy and I started off our conversation with a question of mine about how she thinks about the word politics and why navigating politics, being this astute political navigator in my change catalyst model, is one of the most critical skills to be able to master. Let's dive in. Betsy, welcome to Chain of Learning. In episode nine, when I talked about my Catalyst Change Leader model, one of the letters in Catalyst, K-A-T-A-L-Y-S-T, is being an astute political navigator. And many people came back to me saying, wow, I hadn't thought about navigating politics as something that was really important to my role as a change leader. So I want to start out with this question. What do you think about the word politics and why is navigating politics such an important critical skill for you to master as a change leader in organizations? That's such a great question. And politics is such a loaded issue, especially when you think about politics and government and that type of politics. 
But politics ultimately is really about balancing competing interests and finding value in all of them. Like I think really good politics is valuing all the different perspectives because people see things from different vantage points. So good politics is considering the different perspectives that you are having. Politics gets a bad rap because of its misuse as it relates to the power dynamic, which I'm sure we're going to get into. But just to start off with the definition is it's really about balancing and integrating competing interests in a way that serves the whole. That's what good politics is all about. And tell us a little bit about how you came to discover the importance of navigating politics in organizations to really be successful in your role as an organizational change leader. So I thought a lot about this because I had a feeling you were going to ask me all about this. And I have to go back in time because when did I really figure this out? And it's when I was first getting my job as an internal OD consultant at Disney. And so when when I was applying for the job, we didn't like apply for it. We had an audition for it. So we were given this case study and we had to present our perspective. So it was something about like something like a pleasure island kind of, you know, enterprise was trying to grow. And we had to create our perspective of like, well, how do you grow in the, a certain way? And like halfway through the presentation, all of a sudden, like everybody who was in my group interview, I didn't know it was an audition. I thought I was doing a presentation. They all slipped into role play and they all started fighting with one another. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know, like what in the world's going on? I'm like, is this like a completely like crazy organization? And I realized at that point, like that's what they were testing me on. It wasn't about my OD knowledge and skills. It was all about how do I manage the dynamics in this room? When I'm at Disney, you know, Disney at the time, I think now there's like 70,000, 80,000, I don't know how many thousands of cast members that are there. When I was there, it was about 45,000 cast members with all these myriads of lines of business and a lot of high ego, you know, high performer type. And I was taught very, very early on, you will not survive in this organization if you are not managing, you know, this relational dynamic that's going on here. So that's kind of like, I think the genesis, it became very clear that I was not going to get the job if I didn't know how to manage that room. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you did then and what you discovered through your time at Disney and leading change in other organizations about how do you really navigate the room and navigate both those formal and informal, you know, influence or political structures? You know, like the thing about Disney that was really great is, you know, people were really explicit about different things. But I think that there's I think I, I always came into the role, you know, with a perspective. So as OD consultants, like your listeners are all continuous improvement people, like we all get systems thinking. And I think that I always had this view of like the organizational system from a people standpoint as well. And it's like really valuing all the different perspectives. Like I really believe, like I think my passion around gifts and strengths is like everybody kind of has their role in the show and everybody has to work together. So I got really clear. I kind of had that perspective to begin with. But when I first got to, you know, Animal Kingdom was like my big client system. And, you know, the leaders there were like, they were the wild, wild west kind of people. And they told me straight out, like, if you use any of this OD speak, we're like, you know, we're mm. not going to, we're not putting up with this. And so I had to find a way to break in to even get my foot in the door and get my seat at the table in every single one. So I had like the process of like how I was going to connect with each one of the executives. So I would listen in around like, oh, well, you're really interested. Like, oh, Phil, you're really passionate about like this part. And Beth, you're really interested in this. But it's like, I'm still remembering like, oh, I remember your stake. So that when I was talking to Bob, the president or the vice president of the park, it was like, well, here's the shared perspective. And also it's like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. You have a different vantage point, you know, but then, you know, you start observing like, well, how does work really get done around here? And there's like the meeting before the meeting and, like, who do I have to win over? You start to notice, like, who's the the one that the leader actually turns to? And so it's like, if I want to get this idea bought off, I, I have to navigate not just the formal business lines, but this informal power network to get like, okay, I'm going to get this person to buy in. Now I'm going to take that person with me. And we're going to go get this person to buy in based on how the dynamics were actually shaping up. There's a word in Japanese that's called uh, nemawashi, which really means tilling the soil. And what you're describing as being able to navigate these politics is really that tilling the soil, priming the, the soil for planting the seeds of the ideas and the change that you're trying to have by getting you know everyone's perspective and making sure it's hooked into 
what they're trying to accomplish as well in their language. You know, you've you mentioned sort of speaking that language of their business, not just speaking your OD speak or for those of you who are like lean or agile practitioners, like speaking our jargon. How is that helpful in also navigating this political structure within organizations? So I, I guess I would have to go back even before my Disney time is that when when I was working in the nonprofit organization, like they had like I was working for a nonprofit before I went and worked for Disney. And I was like, I had the formal OD role and there was like this big change that went off and I wasn't even really invited to the table. And I had this mentor who told me this really important thing at the time that I think carried me through every aspect of my career. And he says like, nobody's going to use the expertise the way that you want, want it to be used. They're not inviting you. You always have to go and you have to influence them. So you have to be a proactive advocate. Mm. So I knew that part of my value as an OD consultant is I see something that's possible for them that they don't see. And so they're not going to ask me to lead something that they don't see. I have to convince them and I have to convince them in a way that's in alignment with what they want. You know, so if they're saying, you know, we want to create more collaboration around X, Y, and Z, like I have to have a vision around like, well, it could look like this and here's how you do it. And then I have to kind of figure out how I'm going to get them to buy in. And it's not going to be selling my OD services. So that's one thing that like an OD consultant continues to prove in HR, every single one of us, we want to get to the table and say, well, let me tell you how valuable my expertise is. You know, let me tell you how valuable about what my area of specialty is. And the executives don't give a crap about it. They don't want to know about that. They want to know, how do I get from here to there? So you get them to articulate, these are my goals. And then you give that really good reframing. And it's like, okay, now let me tell you how you can get to these goals. I don't need to tell them my expertise. I need to demonstrate to them my expertise. And when they see it, then it's like, oh, okay. But the credibility that I built is never, ever, ever, ever going to be around what your expertise is and getting them excited about it. It's not that technical side, right? It's about that influence and how you're truly leading the change in, in all these dimensions. You know, so as you continue to grow in your seniority and your experience in leading change, what are some of the key things that you learned to really help you be more effective in doing just the things that you're describing to get the leaders on board and navigate those political dynamics? So the number one thing is, is that you let the agenda emerge and then you align. So like the biggest projects that I did was my last job when I was at Disney, I was responsible for helping. Well, actually, it didn't turn out to be that way. There was this work session that I was leading for the operations executives. So I'll use it as an example. So I was leading this work session and they were saying, you know, we really need to do something for the frontline managers. And we haven't done anything for them for a while. We really need to invest in them. We need to do something to develop them. You know, and somebody said that. And then somebody else is like, well, you know, we should really do something for the guests. We haven't done something for the guests. And so they started having these conversations. We stopped the work session at that moment. And the decision was, it's like, well, I'm going to go talk to every single one of these leaders and find out, well, what's their vantage point? What do they think? What is it that they want? And I still remember every one of these conversations because I remember every single leader's perspective. You know, Jim wanted to go back to the basics. And then I had Kevin, who was like all about like the front line and, you know, and Reggie was all about storytelling or wherever they were at. And I triangulated between where everybody said that they wanted and we labeled it customer and employee engagement. And that's our North Star. So I use that analogy of the blind man and the elephant. And it's like, and I went back to this and I presented, this is what you want. And then I remembered, remember, Reggie, you said this, this is this part. Remember you said this, and I said every single person, and it was the first time, first of all, I got the entire operations executive team, all the parks line, parks leaders, all the line of business leaders to give up everything that they were doing individually to help the guests and the cast and the leaders to stop doing it and agree to work on it together and to retire the seven service guidelines, which was something that was in the, you know, the sacred cow of the organization. I got it done within two weeks. Wow. And like, that's my biggest claim to fame. And it's because I remembered and I always went back to it in every subsequent work session. I never, ever forgot what any leader and I still this was like initiative was 20 years ago. I still remember what every single one of those leaders told me and I integrated it and I found the through line. You heard them and integrated their voices to take all those little all the pieces and put it together as one to align together. That's like so 
transformational. It didn't sound like you were railroading your vision, but you still got to the end result that you wanted and saw was important for the organization as well. Because I heard it from them. Yes. I didn't have the agenda. The agenda was, is I created a bigger vision out of all those pieces. So my vision, I'm very, very clear on my role as an OD consultant. There's the leader and I'm at the right hand. And I never, ever get confused between that. It's my job is to help that leader. But what I do is I get the leader to articulate it. Sometimes it's implicit in their head or I get a leadership team to articulate it. Then I'll use my OD expertise to say, now this is how you're going to get there. That is such an important thing you highlighted here. And what I observe sometimes is a sticking point for people in particular who are in internal consulting types of roles, regardless of it's, you know, an organizational development role, lean or continuous improvement coach or consultant, where sometimes you end up owning the work or the doing or the direction rather than being the one that's partnered with the leaders to leading their change. Talk to me about what you've observed about that impact. If or internal change leaders and whatever your function is are taking over the doing versus being that sort of the right-hand person to help influence the change. I think the second that you cross over that line, you're no longer a consultant. So you kind of picture it like on a continuum. You know, so it's the leader's job is to set the expectations to clarify goals and that kind of thing. It's up to the consultant to clarify the process. So the content is owned by the leader. Mm. The process is owned by the consultant. The, the leader knows what they want to accomplish. And anytime a consultant says, well, they don't really know, we have to offer that. I'm like, that's not really true. That's It's their business, their performance review, their bonuses, their, everything is tied to it. They have a vision. They just might not be able to articulate it. But everybody has a vision. Everybody has a goal. It's my job to draw it out of them, help frame it up for them. You know, and that's why I think sometimes like my credibility as a facilitator was really strong is I know how to sort and organize ideas and say, all right, here's what you're all about. Now, given that, because then they're like, yeah, that's what I want. You know, now, given that, now, let me tell you, based on my expertise that you don't have, you're an expert in running your business. You're not an expert in in how to efficiently, effectively lead a change initiative. So I'm going to tell you how to get there in the best way possible. But I already established my credibility by helping them articulate, you know, like think about an executive and executive team. They've got a thousand thoughts on their minds. Executive teams are all over the map. If you could have someone corral them and say, here's the common rallying cry, you're golden. But it's not like for me to push in and say, well, I want you to have like a customer first organization. Let's say that like I had that as a vision. That's not my job. My job is, is to get them to articulate it. Now I'm going to hook what I'm going to suggest to that outcome. Such a powerful and important distinction for all of us who are in consulting types of roles, regardless if you're internal or external, defining who is the owner of the results and the work and who is the coach, the facilitator, the influencer, the shaper to hold the space for that to happen. You know, one of the things you and I have talked about too is how internal or external consultants also sometimes fall into the trap of being a pair of hands. So that doing the work, and this is very linked to that, you know, driving your vision forward. But how do you help people on your team? Or how did you make this shift to from not falling into that trap of being a pair of hands, but really staying in that influence coaching consulting role? So I think that there was a difference between me as an OD consultant versus a continuous improvement leader or an HR leader or somebody else so, or, or a learning and development leader. You know, when you think about like a continuous improvement leader, you actually have some day-to-day -day responsibilities relative to perform, you know, process improvements and efficiencies and all of that kind of stuff. HR leaders have some responsibilities as it relates to, you know, hiring people, performance management, all of that. As an OD consultant, I never had any official responsibilities. You know, everything I did was sort of like, it's optional. It's all, you know, everything in my career. Like when I think about my entire career, I've always made up my jobs. Like I've always seen something. So I've always been an entrepreneur. <laughs> so I kind of had that as a protection that others wouldn't have. But there's a lot of people that I would say is the pair of hands trap, which, which would be like a leader saying, hey, you know, I want you to design and design to facilitate this work session. And I don't know when I figured out 
it seemed like early on, it's like, that's really a cool idea. But before we get into that, let's back up and talk about the business. Because I believe like training is often necessary, rarely sufficient. Like there's many things that they may ask for. And it's like, well, that's not going to get you to your goal. And I don't know where the courage comes from, you know, but that's not going to get you to the goal. Let's talk about it because I'm passionate about helping you achieve your goal. So I know this is not going to work, but a lot of people get stuck on the pair of hands trap because it's more vulnerable in some ways to say my entire value is based on my influence rather than it's easier to say, well, let me just deliver this because I feel, you know, it's more tangible or it feels more sticky. But I still think that the person who, you know, is at the head of the room with the flip chart and the marker or the person who runs the flip chart and the marker rules the room. And so I think we underestimate the value of influence and we go for safety, which is like, well, I tangibly delivered this workshop for you. I tangibly delivered this. So it's easier to stay in that place. Yes. And again, you know, we've talked about how do you make this shift to the, the sort of official role and responsibility of your defined, you know, job title or position. But these influence skills are the ones that really will help you step into your potential as truly a transformational leader in whatever your field is as well. So it's about mastering, mastering those skills. I want to go back to where we started with some of the discussion around you know, politics. And, you know, you mentioned the word power and power dynamics. And sometimes this is a reason why maybe politics gets a bad rap. Let's dive into that. What do you see of the role of power as it relates to politics? I mean, politics and power all go together, but it's like you could look at it in the good side and the bad side. Power is the ability to act. You know, power has, it's, it's all about like, I have the ability to act. That's what power is. And so it depends on what you're acting on behalf of. So you could say that there's good power, like there's power with, you know, and then there's bad power, which is the power over. You know, when you think about every organization, like you put things on like two sides, like good politics, bad politics. Good politics is, is every organization, every organization is dysfunctional. A hundred percent, every single organization is dysfunctional, but not every organization is toxic. You know, so when you think about a dysfunctional organization, good politics is managing like everybody has like certain part of the power that they are responsible for your delegated power. Maybe the CEO is responsible for everything, but they delegate power to in order for the different business lines to act. And so good politics is understanding that there's value in the different perspectives. Like you need the finances you know, bottom line and check that kind of number kind of perspective to balance out with HR's idealism. You need marketing's like creative out of the box to be balanced with, you know, operations and what they actually can deliver, especially between sales and um, operations. That's a huge conflict point. You could see where all the conflict points are naturally going to emerge out of the business lines. You know, you could see where sometimes like IT could be a friend of operations and it could sometimes be not a friend. You know, you could see all of that. And so good politics is balancing all those perspectives. It's one body with many parts. And sometimes the many parts don't always know that the body's going in that particular direction. Now, toxic organizations, that's a completely different scenario. Toxic is when you have leaders who go with power over, you know, where they look at people as utilitarian ends, you know, means to an end. You know, that's toxic. If you have a narcissistic leader at the top where it's like it's all about them, they gaslight everybody. They don't really care about anybody's opinion. You, you can see how the C-suite makes decisions on like how toxic the organization is because that's going to carry all the way through. So being a political, astute political navigator, there's not much you could do with toxic. I've had like as an external consultant, I would not say Disney was a normal, normally dysfunctional organization in the best way possible. I've had some clients as an external consultant, which is so awful that there was no hope outside of just changing out the entire leadership team, which is what happened. I did this assessment where I swear it was not facilitating focus groups. It was grief groups. It, the leadership and operating practices were so awful, you know, but there was no other option. I had no other recommendation is that you just got to like this. This is I mean, there were suicides in the workplace. It was that bad. Oh, my goodness. So it's like toxic. There's no other choice here. But in normal politics, it's okay that they don't see eye to eye. It's the beauty of what we do as these other people is we can harmonize them and we could bring them both together and say all of it's valuable. 
And that's our role. And so that's not bad. It's not bad that people see things different. It's like you bring them together and it's like, wow, like I think about some of the amazing initiatives that I help lead at Disney with very diverse perspectives. And it's like it became so much better because of that. So it's like it's respecting all of them. But you could see anytime an organization, you could see like when how many time an organization, like we're a sales driven organization, you could see the specific form and shape their dysfunctions are going to come. The sales organization is going to get everything. They're going to be the favorite child. You know, operations is not going to be all that important because they look like a cost center. Forget about them. They're the redheaded stepchildren, you know, and then you could see the flip side is we're just an efficient organization. It's like, well, forget sales and marketing, you know, like they're going to be the redheaded stepchildren. So you can see where that is. And so you can come in as a consultant advisor and somebody who could help. And now we have this beautiful way where we can help them you know, bring that balance, but the toxic and the yeah. power over. Yeah, no. There's nothing you can do. You can only influence so much with, with that type of leadership, which is not much at all. What's the risk if leaders or internal change agents don't really understand how to navigate either these informal or formal political structures for their in effectiveness? You take the best idea with the best project plan with the most talented people, and it will be eaten every single day for lunch by politics. You're just, your ideas are going to go nowhere. Mm. You're going to be stalled out. You won't be able to get anything done. Nobody gets anything done outside of politics in an organization. You just have to be much more aware of it and accepting. So anybody says, I don't want to work in an organization with politics. It's like, well, then you should just sit at home don't even work for anybody else because there's always going to be politics. There's always going to be different perspectives and balancing the perspectives is a good thing. Absolutely. I mean, an organization is made of people and the dynamics with people and are inherently have a political dimension to it. So everyone figure out how to start stepping into your potential to really understand how to be this astute political navigator, and it's going to dramatically increase your effectiveness in whatever your function is. And even if you're you know, an executive or a functional leader too, it is critical to be able to navigate those politics as well. I want to make a, a shift, Betsy, because you and I have been working together for almost two years now, but in a different way. You know, I think one of the reasons we connected so well is because of your experience in working with large, complex organizations and leading change and with this learning perspective and mindset as well. But you've been helping me as a brand consultant, as a business mentor. And one of the ways you work is helping people like me who have their own companies and organizations really help to be more impactful. So I'm really curious about how you see this connection between what you do now as a branding strategist and business mentor with your past roles in leading organizational change. To be an astute political navigator is the same thing that you need to have a really good brand. And it really begins with empathy and respect and appreciation of where everybody's at. So I wound up as an OD consultant. I started my own consulting business. And then people started asking me, like, well, how did you do that? And then they started getting really curious about, like, because I talk a lot about strengths and really leading with your strengths. But I also talked about, like, how I navigate, you know, organizations and the relationship. You know, I always would love branding, you know, ever since I worked at the Animal Kingdom and I was part of that rebranding project. But I think that what makes me successful as a brand consultant for consultants and coaches, particularly those who are working in organizations, is the depth of the understanding and empathy of all the different business lines and the value that I have, like I can get inside their heads. You know, so I always teach people from a branding side and from a marketing side, you know, like you begin with your ideal client and figure out who they are. Like uh, lots of consultants think that I work with like this CEO. I'm like, unrealistic, you know, you might eventually get to the CEO, but no CEO sitting there on the computer looking for a consultant like you. They're gonna look to somebody else on the team and who's that person, you know, and what's their stake? Based on where they sit in the organization, they'll have a different stake. And how do you adapt your language to that person? So if I were talking to an operations person, you know, I would be talking a lot about like, you know, like I could take the same expertise, like, you know, I could help you you know, get your front line to be delivering on the customer expectations and doing it in a way that's efficiently and you can get work done. You know, but if I were talking to like the marketing department, it's like, I'm going to help your front line really live the brand and fulfill the brand and fulfill what it's all about. Like, it's just adapting your language. That's what I did as an internal consultant. That's what I did as an external consultant. And that is what I do as a brand person is all about like speaking the language. 
But even as I was describing like what I suggest with leaders, it's the same stuff that you and I work on with your proposals. Get the leader to articulate their goals, why they're important. It's the same thing I do as a business mentor and helping people land work. It's the same thing. If you want to get them to buy in, you know, to a bigger project, but it's still pivoting from, they may ask you like, oh, Katie, you're amazing. Come in and do our workshop. And you're like, that is awesome. But before we get into this workshop, let's back up and talk about what's going on in the business. That is such critical advice for everyone listening, you know, not only if you have your own business, but also if you are internal and you're trying to get your leaders on board and not just responding to what they think is the format of the intervention that they need or the support that they need, but getting back to what are their goals. And then your you know, secret sauce is figuring out what the right process is to get them to those goals. And so being able to shift our thinking on that is so is so valuable and important for no matter what your, I guess, who your client is or internal, external, and what your outcome is. You know, what are some other tips going on that theme about how to get leaders buy-in, or maybe it's not even buy-in, you know, let's build on what you said about what is their goal and then how you can structure and sort of navigate that sort of one-to-one almost political dynamic about how you engage in that discussion with a leader about what they think they might need, but what you actually know is going to serve them in a different way. There's a different side, like how do you respond and how do you proactively advocate? You know, so how do you respond? So you got to remember, like the client, this is like one key thing I'll remind everybody. When it comes to how to improve the organization from a continuous improvement or transformational change standpoint, whatever methodology or whatever they ask you for, the client is 100% of the time wrong. They're always wrong, not because they're bad, but because they just don't know, you know, so the executive that you might be working with, it says, hey, come in and do this process improvement workshop. And it's like, well, it could work because they're like, oh, it worked this last time. So the way they think is I have a problem. They shoot it through. Here's a solution I'm going to ask you. And so your job at that moment is I'm assuming whatever they're asking for is wrong because they're not looking at the system. They're not a system thinker like I am. They don't see all the parts and they don't really know necessarily. And we haven't triangulated what everybody's thinking. So you have to always say, awesome information, do the validation, always do the empathy and validation. So what I heard you said is you really love my workshops and I'm amazing. And you, you know, I'm pretending they're coming to you. You really love the way I, you know, my positivity and the way I speak. But before we get into that, thank you so much. I love that compliment. Before we get into it, let's back up. And you want to get them to articulate, not the methodology. You don't want to delve into whatever it is they ask for. You want them to get them to talk about the business. When you do that from a stakeholder management standpoint, every single time I get into a new client system, when I was an internal or external consultant, my first order up for bids was always a stakeholder kind of conversation. And I would do like sort of like what I do teach now in a discovery meeting, I'll teach there. And I did it there is ask them, what are your goals? Why do they matter? You know, what's the business impact? But at the business goals, business impact. And then you can get more clarity on that. That's how you get out of that pair of hands. And that's what you need to do. When it comes to proactive advocacy, you know, you see me do this all the time. I've been doing this obviously for 30 years is like, you listen to what they're, what they tell you, you pay attention. Like these are your goals. Then you frame it up and say, what I heard you say is, and this is what I would recommend. This is what's possible for you. And you have to own the fact that you see something that's possible for them that they don't see. And so you own it and you go as a proactive advocate. You don't go as a salesperson. You're not trying to sell your methodology. You're selling them on acting that on what's in their best interest. So everything begins and ends with empathy, understanding, deep listening, and really valuing all the parts. So I was like in the middle of like one client engagement. One of the things that was like obvious that they needed, but nobody really raised it, was a customer assessment. Like we needed to get the customer's voice into this whole thing because it was a big missing piece in the project. But I knew the political system. So I went and talked to the VP of sales and I'm like, Tim, what do you think? I think we should do this. I got him to work through the whole pitch with me, the whole proposal. And then, you know, we were all bought in. We all agreed on it. Then I went and talked to the president. I'm like, what do you think? We should, what do you think we should do? And he's like, well, this is a great idea. I need to talk to Tim. I'm like, cool. You know, got it bought in because I got the right person to buy in, there's no way this would have gone forward if I didn't value Tim and if I didn't value his role. 
and value what he did in his ownership. And I'm not like, I'm not competing with him. The outside the system is the most powerful place to be. You're not below the leader. You're not above the leader. You're not even completely next to the leader. You're outside the system. That's where your power place is. What a fantastic place to be wrapping up our conversation about how to navigate the political system. It's about how can you stay outside of it, see it, navigate it, and help the leaders within your system connect and communicate as well and get to that final vision. Betsy, thank you so much for being on the show. How can listeners get in touch with you, learn more about you, and learn from you? Well, you can find out about me on my website, www.betsyjordan.com. And Jordan is with a Y, not an A. There's another Betsy Jordan out there who gets on my mail. When you get on my website, if you go to that same URL, but slash toolbox, if you're interested in, you know, kind of like this politically savvy embedded approach that I do to consulting, I have a e-course that I captured all my best practices. I got a million swipe files, like tons of questions that you could ask an assessment, how to do a change project, how to do executive coaching, intake forms, proposals for internal consultants and external consultants. It's got a ton of stuff. But this is like my give back to people who really want to you know, do good in organizations. And so I have it set up where it's like you can name your price and 50% goes to micro lending, you know, for micro funding micro micro loans to entrepreneurs and other people in other parts of the world. So it's like my special fun give back offer and opportunity to I, I want more purpose driven people. I want I want the people who really care about creating people centric organizations to be successful and be successful faster. And I can vouch for the amount of knowledge and resources that you have, not only in that amazing offer, but also in just all the work you do and that you share on your podcast too. So maybe just let people know about your podcast so they can go tune in there after they listen to this one. Well, my podcast, it's called Enough Already because it's for people who have had enough already. And you could look at it from a couple different angles, like people have had enough already of like playing small or enough already of like, you know, some of this corporate craziness and stuff like that. And for people who really want to believe that they are enough already, you know, so it's all about like actionable inspiration for people who want to forge their own past, specifically consultants and coaches, advisors, people like us who are trying to, you know, help the world in this way. So it's all about like forging our own path, but also making a difference. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Betsy, for being here today and for helping me also step into my greater potential. So I encourage you all to connect with Betsy. And then if you're liking and enjoying this show, Chain of Learning, please rate and review and share this episode with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep growing our chain of learning together. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Katie. Mastering the skills of being an astute political navigator, managing stakeholders, influencing decision makers, and tilling the soil for change is one of the most important skills that you need to master. If you want to be an effective leader, continuous improvement change agent, or consultant, it's how you step into your potential as a transformational leader and how you lead through influence rather than direct power. As you can tell from this conversation with Betsy, many of the competencies of the Change Catalyst model complement, support, and reinforce each other, such as being an astute political navigator, a skillful facilitator, an analytic systems thinker, and more. If you haven't yet downloaded my Catalyst self-assessment, go do so now. The links are in the show notes for this episode, and you can also go directly to kbjanderson.com slash catalyst, K-A-T-A-L-Y-S-T. And be sure to go back to listen to episode nine of this podcast to learn more about each competency. And be sure to reflect on this episode. What is one key takeaway of my conversation with Betsy Jordan about how you can become a more astute political navigator? Set your own intention for practice about how you're going to improve in this competency and how you're going to step into becoming an even greater change leader. And if you need outside support for yourself or your leaders from someone like me, I'd be happy to help. I love supporting continuous improvement change leaders and executives like you to master these skills, to lead change and create high-performing learning organizations. 
You can learn more about my trusted advisor, team coaching, and leadership development programs on my website, kbjanderson.com. The link is in the show notes as well. Be sure to follow and subscribe to Chain of Learning now so that you never miss a future episode. I'm going to keep diving into other competencies of the Change Catalyst model and so much more. And be sure to share this podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can strengthen our chain of learning together. Thanks for being a link in my chain of learning today. I'll see you next time.